Okay, um, good evening, good afternoon and good morning, depending on where you are sitting. Uh, welcome to this socialprotection.org webinar about new evidence on the effectiveness of targeting in social protection programs. How to reach the poorest in our societies and how to make sure that no one is left behind is a critical debate in sustainable development and not the least when it comes to the design of social protection systems. How to best select recipients for social protection programs has been and remains to be a hot and debated topic. Um, however, as with any discussion, we feel it's important that these debates are underpinned by evidence. You can go to the next slide. Um, and therefore, Development Pathways, with the support of Church of Sweden, is today launching uh, its new research on this subject, which you will be able to take part of during this webinar. Yes, and the report is available uh, as from now at Development Pathways site, and I think you will also be able to see a link for it in the chat bar to the right. Um, so my name is Gunilla Palm and I am a policy advisor for social protection at Church of Sweden and I will be moderating this session. I will now introduce to you our speakers. Uh, the report will be presented by one of its main authors, Dr. Stephen Kidd. Stephen is a senior social policy specialist at Development Pathways and he has more than 30 years experience of engaging in social development and social protection across Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean and the Pacific. He has also led DFID's social protection work and also the policy work at HelpAge International, as well as a development program in Paraguay. Uh, after Stephen's presentation, I will invite two expert discussants to comment on this research. And first, we have Dr. Magdalena Sepulveda. She is a senior research associate at the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development. She is also a member of the Independent Commission for the Reform of International Corporate Taxation. Uh, she previously served as the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. And she has also been on the high level panel of experts on food security and nutrition of the United Nations Committee on World Food Security. That's a mouthful. Uh, and Magdalena's 20 year career has focused on the intersection of poverty, development and human rights, where she has bridged research with activism. And the other discussant is Dr. Andrew Fisher who is an associate professor of social policy and development studies at the Institute of Social Studies and a laureate of the European Research Council starting grant in 2014. He's also the founding editor of the book series of the UK and Ireland Development Studies Association and published by Oxford University Press and editor at the journal Development and Change. His book, Poverty as Ideology, won the 2015 International Studies in Poverty Prize. Uh, and Andrew's research and teachings are centrally concerned with the role of redistribution in development at local, regional and global scales. Uh, and I've already introduced myself, but I will just say a few words about Church of Sweden's work with social protection. Um, well, we work uh, together with faith-based partners mainly to realize the rights to social protection for all. And coming from the long history of faith-based actors in providing social services and support to those living in the socioeconomic margins. So together with ecumenical and civil society partners, we engaged in advocacy and policy dialogue on local, national and global level, promoting inclusive and rights-based social protection systems. Church of Sweden is also a member of the Global Coalition for Social Protection Floors. You can go to the next slide. So the last 30 minutes will be devoted to a Q&A from you, the audience, and you are all able to pose questions to the speakers uh, throughout the session, and you do so by typing them in the chat bar to your right. Uh, 
yeah, and in the end, we will try to respond as many questions as possible. So with that, I will hand over the word to Stephen to guide us through this new and interesting, exciting evidence. Right. Thanks very much, Gunilla, um, for, for the introduction. I'd like to start by really thanking the Church of Sweden for helping us fund uh, this, this research on the effectiveness of, uh, of targeting in social protection. Um, I undertook it with uh, a colleague, Deloa Atias, uh, who was the main, uh, one of the other main researchers on it, but we did get support from a number of other people in Development Pathways who I'd like to thank um, as well for um for the for their work now targeting is a big hot issue in 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 social protection um there's lots of debates about it lots of people on different sides of the debate a lot of people who who are true believers in poverty targeting and and, and want to push poverty targeting because they believe that you know we've really got to help the the very very poorest members of society so therefore we should put, target them um and there are others who argue well no no let's look at much more to, uh, more inclusive approaches, much more universal approaches to, and that they are, will argue that they'll be much more actually effective in reaching people who are who are living in, in poverty. So we have lots of these, uh, we have big debates going on, lots of people on different sides in terms of promoting the different approaches. So what we thought is, well, let's actually just look at the evidence uh, on this uh, in terms of uh, how accurate are different poverty targeting or targeting mechanisms. Um, uh, across the world, in, 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 across all continents that we could find. So we looked around low and middle income countries to undertake the, 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 the research. So go to the next slide. Um, so the research questions that we were trying to address through in this is, you know, so look at different types of targeting mechanism and see just how effective they are in reaching their, their, their intended recipients. Basically, this is the the exclusion errors of these uh, of, of these programs. Out of those that we intend to incorporate in the program, um, how what proportion are excluded from that program, irrespective of the type of uh, targeting mechanism? But then we also decide look because a lot of people think well we should be trying to reach the the, the very poorest. And obviously, as a priority, that would be great to to do. We want to see well so how effective are different types of targeting mechanism in reaching those living in extreme poverty who we classified for simple reasons in each country the poorest 20 percent of the intended category for that program by intended category we mean for example if a if there was an old age pension uh, for for people over 60 then we'd we'd include all older people over 60 as part of the intended category if a program was targeted at poor households then we include all households in the country as the intended category so if i use that term that's what i mean when, uh, um, when I'm talking about it. So if we can move to the next slide. So overall, we managed to examine 23 national household data sets. That's across 23 um, countries. Um, we were limited in that we had to try and find uh, national household data sets that were available to us. So we managed to find uh, uh, this number, but also that we needed to find uh, household data sets that also gave information on who was actually accessing different types of social protection program. So overall, in these 23 countries, we were able to assess 38 um, social protection schemes in, in, in total. And we looked at a variety of different types of um, um, targeting mechanism. So in some countries, and unfortunately, we didn't get uh, as many as we would like uh, uh, in universal schemes. It was a lack of the availability of the data, but we did look at some universal schemes. We also looked at means testing um, in low and middle income countries, proxy means testing, which of course is now uh, um, being used in many, many countries, community-based targeting, self-targeting, and what's called pension testing. That's That, that means if you get a... Um, if you get another type of state pension, so a civil service pension or a social insurance pension, and there is a social pension in the country, then you the, then you unable to get access to that social pension. It's a very very simple form of income uh, tax that that a number of countries use for their old age pensions. And we assessed effectiveness by identifying the households who had a recipient in the intended category, and ranked the households according to consumption or in some cases income, if that was the only data available we ranked households from the sort of poorest to the, to the richest 
and try to see who was receiving the, the program within the intended category and who wasn't. So these are the kind of results that we're going to present. What we don't do in the paper is get into a lot of the other arguments about, uh, uh, about um, social um, protection, about uh, you know, uh, rights or incentives or, or popularity or sustainability, et cetera, different types of programs. We're just really here trying to focus on the actual effectiveness in terms of their accuracy of the scheme. So we move to the next slide, please. So I'll get straight into presenting the, the results. So obviously a big thing that people are interested in, you know, this idea that you know, people have, if we want to, you know, help the poorest, we should target the poorest. So how well does that work across a, a, a range of countries? You can see the, the countries that we looked at here. So what we have on this slide are all the examples of, of targeted programs that are actually trying to target 25% or less of the intended category. So they're trying to target down at the very poorest members of their society. So we wanted to see what kind of errors do we have in terms of these programs, the exclusion of the intended beneficiaries. And you can see here, this is all the examples that we have. We have we've put them in different types of targeting mechanism from proxy means test, community-based targeting, and means testing. And you can see the errors, the exclusion errors of the intended recipients um, of the, the program are, are, are put here and sort of ranked here. So we can see, you know, that's actually the best performing program is a means test the program, program using a very simple means test, which is Brazil's Bolsa Familia. You know, it's the most effective, but in fact, its errors are still, if I can see, uh, at around um, 45%. So about 45% of the intended uh, recipients of Bolsa Familia are still being excluded. And that's the best program poverty targeted program that we can find in the world. And the errors increase from there, right up to Rwanda's um, BUP program for public works and Guatemala's um, um, Ibono Seguro program, which uses the proxy means test, which are, really have errors at around 96 or 97%. That means virtually everybody who is expected to be on the program is actually excluded from the, the program. And we see a range of different errors right across here some very well-known programs uh, mexico's prospero which has just been eliminated by the mexican government but has become very famous as the former opportunidades program has errors um well above 50 percent uh, also and we have other programs um like uh um, um colombia's uh, um um uh, the proxy means test uh, program in, in Colombia, which is having areas of around 60%. So there's a very, very high exclusion of the intended recipients. So really the evidence we can see from poverty targeting is that they're not very, poverty targeted programs are not very effective in actually reaching their intended recipients who are meant to be those living in extreme poverty in the country. We move to the next slide. Um, so this is, looks a very similar slide. It, the results are actually very, very similar, but we're looking at the effectiveness of programs in reaching the poorest 20%. Now, of course, in this, we're looking at under coverage. So programs that then perhaps are targeting only three or 4% of the population, obviously they're gonna have high, high errors because they're not reaching um, 20%. And often that's because these programs that have targeted the very poorest are not, not very popular programs. So governments don't put much investment in them. And that's pretty much part of what's driving their, their ineffectiveness because they have very um, 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 low, they have relatively low budgets and then they have very, very low um, coverage. So as you can see here, we have a very, very similar pattern. I won't spend much time on here, um, but again, in this um, one, we find that the Philippines Pantowid program uh, using a proxy means test, again, is, is the most uh, effective, but it's about the only one that actually has errors of, of of um, less than 50%. So virtually every poverty target program that we looked at actually was not managing to reach even 50% of those in the poorest 20% of the population. So a whole load of people living in, in extreme poverty, really talking in many of these countries about hundreds of millions of people across all of these countries, because we're looking at countries like India and Indonesia, et cetera, Vietnam, are ex being excluded systematically from programs for which they are actually uh, meant to be in. So we go to the next slide, please. So the paper also looks at, um, you know, tries to then uh, not just look at the poverty targeted programs, but then looks across all the programs that we managed to, to, to study. So that included some universal programs, such as Mongolia, which um, child, um, um, child money program, George's old age pension, a couple of universal programs in Bolivia, 
the sort of school stipend program and their old age pension. Some schemes with, um, which were had high coverage, such as the old age pension in um, South Africa, the child support grant there. Some with medium coverage, as you can see in Uruguay, Ecuador, um, Mexico and Vietnam. And then again, the, the more poverty targeted programs. And as you might expect, when we're looking at the exclusionary of these programs, the exclusionary against their intended recipients, unsurprisingly, the exclusionaries are much, much lower the higher the coverage and the lowest amongst the, 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 the universal programs. There are, uh, you know, in, in, we'll look in more detail in individual programs later, but some of the universal programs only have errors of about one or two percent, very, very small errors. And the, the, the highest errors are in, are in Bolivia with about eight uh, or so percent in terms of the um, exclusion errors. But as you go down, there's a strong correlation that the higher the coverage of the the, or the lower the coverage of the programs, therefore the more targeted they are, the higher the exclusion error, which is to be expected, but now we have the evidence to show that. So if you're only targeting very, very few people in your population, you're gonna end up um, having very, very high errors. And you can look at the, the, the programs there. I've already discussed some of the, the programs with the type of errors that they have, but you can see most of the programs are again with exclusion errors to the right of the 50%, so very, very high exclusion errors uh, that we have there. Go to the next slide. So in, in, this, in this next slide, it's, it's again, it's a very, very similar um, um, look, but we're then looking at the proportion of the poorest 20% excluded from the program, as we did before, just looking at the correlation. We have a very similar correlation, again, uh, that we have there. Much higher coverage means that uh, the, 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 the programs are much more effective in incorporating the very poorest members of society. And by far the most effective programs are either universal programs or South Africa's um, old age um, grant and child support grant, which are targeted at, uh, at around just over 70% of the population. So they, they, they're trying to reach the vast majority, but the, um, but actually have zero exclusion of the, they manage to reach everybody in the poorest 20%. But again, as we target more, target more, the poorest 20% of the poorest 10%, we find that errors go up and up so that we get with more poverty targeting, more exclusion of those living in poverty. So we move to the next slide. So I want to, um, I want to move on quickly now, and I want to look at, uh, at some of the, the evidence around individual programs. So what we have in the paper is we have all the individual programs. We have graphs that look something like the one here. Okay, so I just wanted to explain how to read these individual, these graphs and individual programs, um, because I'm gonna go through a range of different programs, many of them well known, just to look at the kind of uh, errors. Now, in these, um, so on these graphs for the individual programs, we're looking at the uh, coverage of, of, of uh, who's getting, who, who is actually receiving the programs across the consumption or the income distribution or the welfare distribution from on the on the x-axis from the the poorest the lowest on the left to the highest on the right that's the the richest members of society okay that's what we're looking at we're looking at the distribution across that within the intended category of the population and that includes within you know if a program was targeted in a particular geographic area we only looked within that geographic area we didn't look nationally so we could see actually more the the effectiveness of that particular program now to to see who are the intended category, we looked at the effectively the coverage of the program. So the red line that you can see that goes up on, 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 the, on the graph, that's the point at which it is the coverage of the program. And we, we, we assume that that therefore is the intention of the, the, the government, the program administrators to reach that proportion of the population. So if it's reaching as in this example, which is actually the, the PKH program in Indonesia, it's reaching around 7% of uh, households with children in the country. So we're looking at how effective is it in reaching the poorest 7% of households with children, because that's the, um, that, that's the, the, the target population. And what you can see is what we've done is that we've, if you look at the black line that's going across where we have uh, the different colors above and below it, that black line shows for each percentile of the, of, of, uh, the, of the intended category, that's of each 1% of the intended category, We've looked at what proportion, who is receiving it within that, what proportion of that 
are actually receiving the 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 benefits or um, um, or on the registry because some of the examples that we have are actual sort of social registries which are trying to identify um, people living in poverty. So here you can see on this black line, you can see all those underneath the black line in the in each one percent are those who are reached by the program, and all those above the black line are those who are excluded from the program. So in this example, you can see that uh, although it's targeting the poorest twenty percent, we are at seven percent. We have a relatively flattish kind of a distribution of in, in in Indonesia. And the actual exclusion area, which is the pink bit, is around 82% of the intended uh, recipients are excluded by the program and uh, include are only 18%. And the inclusion area, I don't have time to go into, is exactly the same size as the um, exclusion area. So now having explained that, I want to go on to show you um, the results from some individual programs and if you look at the report you can see a lot more programs in there some of them which are quite well um, known so we can move to the next slide so i'll start by looking at some of the universal schemes that we that that, that, that we examined and see how effective um, they they were so we move to the next slide again so this is actually mongolia's universal child money child money scheme right so we're looking here at the percent of the proportion of households with children aged 17 and under across the country, because it's a universal program that's going to every child in the country to see who's receiving it and who isn't. Now we don't have a red line here because it's a universal program, so everybody in this intended category is meant to receive it. And what you can see here is that it's a very, very effective mechanism. The exclusion error is only 2%, very tiny group, seems to be more among those who are a bit, who are a bit better off and so very, very effective program. And of course, amongst the poorest 20 or 30% that we can see, those to the left, then we have almost 100% exclusion. It's incredibly effective in actually reaching the very, very poorest members of um, uh, or, or, uh, children in Mongolia. Of course, for those who know, unfortunately, uh, the government of Mongolia, after this uh, survey was undertaken, were forced by um, um, the IMF and the World Bank and Asian Development Bank to target their program and are now having to target it at the at, at the, 80, suppose the poorest 80% of, of children using a proxy means test. Unfortunately, we don't have the results on that, but I think we can be pretty sure that that will have led to more exclusion of the poorest children. So we move to the next slide. So the next slide is looking at uh, Bolivia's Renta Dignidad, universal social pension. Now you can see actually it's an interesting because even though it's a universal program, we do have some exclusion there. It's about 8% of older people over 60 are excluded from the Renta Dignidad um, social pension. So it's not actually um, 100% as effective as, as Mongolia's uh, child money program. We have another example of a pension, Georgia's old age pension, which is very, very effective, only excludes about 1%. So we have some, so we can see that universal programs will leave some people potentially in some situations outside. Of course, they're way more effective than poverty targeted programs. We can see that virtually every older person living in poverty in Bolivia is reaching, is uh, getting the program, but there are some that are excluded about, um, six or seven percent of the very poorest are excluded we don't we didn't get into why that might be but there could be reasons of, of, of perhaps people with ex, with uh, very severe disabilities very old people with very severe disabilities are perhaps finding challenging to access the program or haven't heard of the program there could be reasons like that and at the top end it may be because some people were better off and they didn't feel as though they would access the program so it's uh, not Perfectly effective, but it's pretty effective and much more effective than any of the tar poverty targeted programs that we looked at. So move on to the next slide. And uh, we're looking at means testing. Now, means testing is interesting because you'll often get here people argue you can't do means testing in um, low and middle income countries because you know, many people are in the informal economy. And so we don't know what they're what they're earning. It's impossible to do. These programs are going to be very, very inaccurate because people can lie about the the, their income, so we can't do means testing. That's what we can only do in high income countries. In reality, though, there are a number of middle income countries that actually do means tests. And in most cases, they're pretty simple means tests in which you basically declare your income to the government and you basically swear that you've told the truth. There may be some simple tests. If for people who are in the formal economy, they may test it against, um, say, uh, uh, the income tax database just to check that you're telling the truth. 
South Africa is a country that has it where if you've declared that you're employed, you have to bring your wage slip, but everybody else just has to tell the truth and they have to sign and say in South African affidavit that says, I've told the truth. Okay, now you would think that that's not going to work, it's not going to be very, very good, but let's look at the results of simple means testing. Okay, so we move to the next slide. This is actually Brazil's Bolsa Familia program. If you remember, I said it's the actually the best poverty targeted program that we managed to, to find. It still has errors of uh, exclusion errors of 44%. So it's not actually, you know, it's still excluding a very, very high proportion of, uh, of those who need it. it the pattern is very interesting in that uh, amongst the very, very poorest uh, members of uh, uh, Brazilians, it actually has much lower um, inclusion. That could be similarly for reasons perhaps of, uh, of, of disability, of people not knowing about the program, find it difficult to access. Um, it's a, it's a interesting pattern, but this is the most effective um, poverty targeted program that we managed to, to, to find, but still has an exclusion error of 44%. Now, the interesting thing about um, Brazil, it's targeting the poorest. And actually at that, at, at that point, there's not very much difference between actually the incomes of uh, of the people who are um, above the income eligibility line and below the income eligibility line. So it's surprising that it's actually this effective. However, I think the reason why this is in Brazil means testing is effective is probably not because of the, uh, the accuracy of the means test itself, but because the program uses um, uh, quotas. And so they're kind of ge strong geographic elements. So each municipality is given a quota of beneficiaries that quota is based on the number of people living in extreme poverty in the in the in the country, and we suspected that that's probably what's driving much of the success of Bolsa Familia, not necessarily the means test. So we move to the next slide. What we did then was to then look within Brazil. Um, uh, when the next slide comes up, you'll be able to see it. Can we can we move on? Yeah. So you can see um, on this slide. I think actually, I, I hope you can all see the the trend line on it because it seems to have disappeared from the from the graph that that, that uh, I can see here, maybe my screen. But what we did was we looked within Brazil, within uh, each state in Brazil, and looked at the and looked at compared as we did internationally, looked at the relationship between coverage and exclusion uh, errors. And what we found in Brazil, and I hope you can see it. Um, here, but you can certainly see it in the, in the report, is of course with higher coverage, then we got lower exclusion areas as we find internationally. But actually when you get down to areas where the means test was used in Rio de Janeiro, Santa Catarina, um, Sao Paulo, uh, where we had much lower proportion of, of, of the population receiving the program, then areas once and more became very, very high. Okay, so it's not really showing here the that the means test was particularly successful. What this has probably shown us is that the geographical elements of the Bolsa Familia, the sort of geographical, not quite targeting, but the, the quotas that are there, that's what's driving the relative success of Bolsa Familia. We move to the next one. And the next one, the, the next slide, um, we look at South Africa. Now, South Africa is interesting because it uses a means test, as I explained before, people just self-declare their income. Um, but what South Africa does, rather than trying to target the very, very poorest, they recognize that in South Africa, actually most people are living in poverty and actually need support and need support from the Child Support Grant. So in fact, they target the program at around 80% of the population, end up with about 71% um, coverage. Now what we're seeing here on this is actually it's pretty effective to a large extent because of the, the, the high coverage. Um, but we can see that the exclusion error is only around 13% of the intended category is, is receiving the program. As you can see, amongst the very poorest 20%, many of those fa families, in, in according to the data set, had no income at all. Their only income was from the child um, support grant, and, um, and, and all of those were incorporated within the program. At the point of the red line, which is more or less where people should be, we're hoping that people are telling the truth and uh, come in, there's quite a sharp drop down, which shows actually that people are, um, telling the, the, the truth. And probably if we look a little bit to the right, many of those that are included are probably because we're not looking at the exact moment at which they were targeted. We're looking just perhaps a, uh, or selected about a year or two uh, down the line. And there may have been some changes in, the, in, in, the, um, uh, in their incomes um, because they have to reapply every three years for the program. 
Okay, so we move on to the next um, set, which is, uh, oh no, this is just uh, trying to explain the, the what might be the relative success. And I think the relative success in South Africa is because it's really using an affluence test. Instead of targeting the poorest, it's trying to exclude the wealthy from the program. And here we're looking at the distribution of, um, of household um, monthly per capita incomes from the poorest at the left or up to the richest at the right. This follows the black line and shows the, the relative income. So you can see that it's relatively flat, the distribution for about 80% of the population. There's not so much difference. It's a relatively flat um, distribution. But as you get to the, 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 the better off, then we find much more differentiation in the actual um, incomes that people have. And what the South Africans are doing are they're targeting about that point and discouraging the very richest to, to not enter into the program and are doing it relatively um, successfully um, in, in South Africa. So you end up with a relatively effective uh, um, targeting um, mechanism. And it's interesting you know, to have a country that actually recognizes that most people need social protection but they've decided in this case to take out the, the top and, it, and it's working, but it does lead to some people who actually need the child support grant still not uh, accessing it. If we were to dig more into the data, I think we find that there are other reasons for people not accessing it also. So we move on to the next one. Um, so now we'll look at proxy means tests. I'm sort of running short of time, so I'll go through this uh, quite quickly. The proxy means tests that we know, if we move to the next slide, are very popular. They've been pushed very much by uh, international agencies. As you can see, uh, there's, uh, you know, we found a number of papers in which the World Bank claims that proxy means tests can accurately and cost effectively target the chronic poor. And proxy means tests are being sold, very much part of loan programs. Many donors are behind, not just the World Bank, and trying to get countries to take on these proxy means tests. Now, for those who don't know, the proxy um, means test. Um, how it works is that you use national household surveys and you try to identify a, cor a correlation between certain characteristics of households and consumption or income in some in some cases. We're trying to find you know whether things like uh, um, you know um, uh, house your characteristics of your house, what type of roof you've got, what type of floor you've got, what type of walls, are they durable goods, productive assets that you might have, um, education levels, etc. Uh, of the of, of people in the household. We're trying to find some kind of correlation between those and poverty. Any individual one doesn't have a strong correlation, but you bring together a sort of multiple, uh, a group of them, say perhaps 20, and you'll find you know, that uh, when we get this sort of uh, multiple proxies, we find some kind of correlation. Often the R squared, that's the efficacy, which is a way of measuring the targeting, the, the efficacy of the correlation is between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6. So overall, it means that we're finding about half the explanation of why uh, of household consumption, but we're not actually explaining about half it as well. Once you've got your, your proxies identified, you then put together a scorecard and then you go out to households and you try to, you ask them the questions to see whether they have these uh, these different things in the household. So if they have a refrigerator, you say, yes, they've got a refrigerator. If they've got a television, yes, they've got a television. You ask them, what's the level of education at the head of the household? Secondary education, you put that down. And then you run that in your computer in an algorithm, and the algorithm then spews out scores and then ranks people, predicts whether you're from, uh, your, your relative income in the uh, um, for the country and rank can rank people in terms of their predicted income from the poorest to the richest. So we pass on to the next slide. And so we can see here, we did the same thing that we did before. We tried to see whether there's a relationship with proxy means tests between coverage and, um, and, and uh, the exclusion errors. And as you can see on this graph, yes, we found that also with proxy means tests, of course, um, you would expect that even just looking at the design areas in proxy means tests, you get this. The lower the coverage, uh, or the, the, then the higher the errors. And we find some very, very high errors. Ghana's LEAP program, the uh, Mi Bono Seguro program, Guatemala getting up to over 95% exclusion errors. And are, are, most are around 50 to 70% to exclusion errors. So not particularly uh, effective. We move to the next slide. And the next slide should show Peru's Juntos program. This is the one I think that we found which was the most effective proxy means test when it measured also against its intended coverage. You can see the distribution here. It still has an exclusion error of 46% um, 
from that. So it's still, you know, leaving out a very, very high proportion of the very, very poorest, which are its targeting target group. We move to the next one. You know, I think uh, that was the very best. For the next slide, we'll see um, Pakistan's Benazir Income Support Program here. Now, this we know the cost of doing the targeting there was around sixty million dollars in two thousand nine to do the survey. And then you can see the results here, not particularly effective. The exclusion error is 73%, even though this program is often sold as a very as having pretty effective targeting. We can see it actually has a very, very high exclusion error. This was around 2012, where we were looking at the household survey uh, there. So the vast majority are being um, excluded from the program, despite $60 million being, being, uh, being spent on, on that. Unfortunately, a lot of other donors have got behind this 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 targeting mechanism in Pakistan and have used it to target a range of other programs and obviously getting the same kind of errors. So they're actually leaving out many people living in extreme poverty. We move on to the next one. I think uh, some programs, particularly in Africa, have tried to combine targeting mechanisms, use community-based targeting, where the community selects people and then the proxy means test is used on those selected by the community, the community trying to determine who are the poorest, on the argument uh, you know, that, uh, that the community should know um, who deserves it. And so we looked at the Kenya's Hunger Safety Net program only in the four counties in which it's working. And you can see here its effectiveness against its target population of around the poorest 20% of households, exclusion error is 70%. And it's apart from the very, very poorest, it's pretty much random selection, uh, or would have been no better than random selection. You may as well have almost done a lottery and you would have come up with pretty much the same result although this was a very, very expensive targeting uh, mechanism. Move on to the next slide. So we look, um, why, why are we getting these errors? Uh, if some of you heard me before, you might have seen these, um, the, this kind of, uh, uh, of slide. This is actually looking just at the design errors within the, within the proxy means test, where we're looking from the, where we're trying to see where, what kind of correlation there is between actual household consumption and predicted household consumption from the proxy means test. So here we've ranked according to the proxy means test from poorest to richest along the bottom and from poorest to richest uh, up at the top and on the, uh, on the, on the y-axis. But on the y-axis, we have the actual consumption. So that's the more accurate measure of well-being. And then we have <clears throat> the proxy means test ranking along the, the bottom. Now you would expect in a proxy means test that have perfectly accurate that all those blue dots, each of which is a household, would be lined up in a, in a perfect uh, diagonal line from bottom left to top right. There would just be one line and that would be perfect accuracy. But as you can see, we have a big splatter. It's almost as if we'd thrown the cash out of a, out of a, out of a heli helicopter. And here we can see now where we've, um, the dotted red line, the perpendicular one, um, is showing what the 20%, all us to the left of that are the 20% poorest who are predicted by the proxy means test. And the horizontal dotted red line, all those below are those who are actually the poorest 20% in the country. And you can see that uh, all those who are correctly included, and you can see all the exclusion errors. So you can see some blue dots right to the right of the incredibly poor um, uh, households in Uganda, but they would be excluded despite the extreme poverty from the um, bioproxy means test because of the inaccuracies that, 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 that you have with the proxy means test. So we're going to move to the next slide. We also have implementation errors, of course, with the proxy means test when you go out to do the scorecard. And there's a lot of um, errors in actually doing the scorecard. We don't have time to get into that. Uh, we've written other papers which we've gone into more detail on the kind of errors and the implementation errors. This is just showing the errors in Indonesia when they did a national survey of 40% of the uh, of households and how accurate were they. So they went back immediately uh, with independent enumerators to check the accuracy. And they found that on the cells, just on the scorecard, on average, 15% have been inaccurately entered for one reason or the other. And in one part of Java, it was almost over 35% of cells have been inaccurately entered. So you can see this is where we're getting the implementation errors that are coming into it. So we, you can look at some other papers that we've written which explain the, the reasons for these implementation errors. So I'll just move on to the, to the last one. Or the, or the asset, which I'm only going to look at uh, community-based targeting. I'm not going to look at the other targeting mechanisms that we found very few cases. So it's often argued that the community knows best, so we should get the community to make the decision. So we thought we'll, we managed to find a few countries, um, Ethiopia, 
uh, Rwanda and Vietnam that we use in basically community-based targeting to see how effective it was there. So we move to the next slide. And we find that in Ethiopia on the Productive Safety Net program, very well-known program, actually has very, very high um, errors, uh, exclusion errors. There's around 81%. Um, of the intended recipients of the Productive Safety Net program in Ethiopia are excluded. That's incredibly high, as in its neighbor, Northern Kenya. It's pretty much random selection, so you almost could have done a lottery in Ethiopia. And I'm not going to show any of the other examples of the community-based targeting for time, so you can look at the paper to see that. So we move on to the last two or three slides. I think, you know, looking at these results, I think we, you know, we have to ask, why use poverty targeting? You know, and the reality is people, you know, um, we always talk about the poor and the non-poor, but actually the, the, uh, the, the poor who we're trying to target, it's a kind of a fictional construct. In reality, as we can see here, for a range of different countries, we're looking at what proportion of the population are below different international um, poverty lines. In most countries, the vast majority of people are living in, in poverty, are living on low incomes. We're using here purchase and power parity Term. So this is kind of the standard of living you would have in the United States. And we can see here in a country like um, um, Bangladesh, we have, you know, almost 90 percent of the population living under five dollars a, a day, which is kind of we're only allowing you just to eat in the United States uh, if you had five dollars a day. So this is pretty, pretty um, high levels of, uh, of poverty, of low incomes. And that's around 80% of the population. In African countries like Uganda, we find that poverty levels are much, much higher. Incomes are very, very low. And only a tiny proportion of the population there has an income above $10 a day in purchase and power parity terms. What we put in little black numbers there alongside each of them are actually what that is in real dollars. Because people often get confused when we hear $10 a, a day. They think it's, some people think it's $10. It's actually very much less. So if you look in, 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 in Uganda, $10 is actually $3.40 um, in real dollars there. So even in Uganda, it actually seems like quite a little amount that, that you have there. So people are living, most people are living on very low incomes. So why are we trying to target a group supposedly at the bottom when actually most people in countries are, are in need and very strongly of social protection programs? We move to the next slide. And what we also show in the paper is actually not only are most people living on low incomes in most countries, but actually incomes are very, very, are very dynamic. So here's just shown a couple of examples from in Uganda and Indonesia, looking at the change in ranking of households. So in each of these graphs, you can see on the on the left hand side for, for, for the uh, beginning year, we rank people from the poorest 20 percent to the richest 20 percent. And then we see where they're ranked very short period later, so only two years later in, in Uganda and one year later only in Indonesia. And we see a very, very significant movement right across the, the, the board. People are moving up and down as they, they face shocks or take opportunities. And actually, there's, there's very, very big movement. This means that, that actually the kind of static targeting models that we have, such as proxy means sets, are never going to work given the dynamics of this. But it also means that people who look at one year might be a little bit better off. The next year they could be really down uh, and, and and struggling. So in Indonesia, it's it's almost 50% of the population one year, and the poorest 20%, almost 50% of them were new into the poorest 20% just one year later. Okay, so that uh, this again brings the question: you know, why are we targeting the very very um, poorest um, if actually most people are living on low incomes, and actually many many people are at real risk of falling? into that in, into in, into poverty or, or having a facing a reduction of standards of living so just move on um to the to the end some conclusions and i'm sorry i've gone slightly over i think the conclusion from this just looking at the evidence on the accuracy is that look if we really if we truly want and you know as the sustainable development goals would say and everybody gets behind to leave no one behind if we truly want to actually include everybody then we have to stop doing poverty targeting based on the evidence that we have it needs to be abandoned or restricted to small residual schemes but we can't use poverty targeting as the basis of our national social protection or social security system because we will exclude the vast majority of um, of, of people this big new idea that we have around the social registries, which are used to target people often using proxy means tests. I've written about them, they're called antisocial registries. They're not gonna work. We can see from the evidence, 
they won't work. They'll lead to the majority of those living in poverty being excluded from schemes. And if it's used across a range of social schemes, then people are going to be excluded from a whole, the poorest people, the majority are going to be excluded from a whole range of schemes. And it's interesting that in Europe, in the EU, they banned recently the use of algorithms on, uh, on Europeans for targeting uh, process. You have to have a human intervention. You can't use an algorithm, but still Europeans and others are still using these algorithms for targeting in Africa and Asia and Latin America, even though they would be banned in Europe. Um, we have to recognize that, you know, behind while people think poverty targeting is a great thing to do to help the poor, it's actually much more supported by elites because actually with poverty targeting, elites are the winners out of this because they pay, because poverty targeted programs are much less costly, they're much cheaper then the amount of tax required is much less, so the rich pay a lot less in taxes. So ultimately, compared to a universal scheme, the richer will end up being overall winners because while they may receive a benefit from the universal scheme, they'll pay much more in tax. Um, and uh, whereas in poverty targeted schemes, they'll, they'll pay a lot less in tax, so they're net winners with poverty targeting. And that's why poverty targeting generally tends to be supported by the rich and elites. And universal schemes, or obviously something that is much more associated with the left, because that's about trying to help the majority of the population, including those living in inequality. And I think ultimately, of course, when we're looking at this, we need to bear in mind the costs. But we need to remember that quality costs. If we want to have effective programs that really reach people that we want them to reach, we need to have universal or high coverage programs, perhaps affluence testing, um, and that's going to cost. They're going to be more expensive, those, those programs, but we're going to have much more success. And we need to build national social security or social protection systems within a broader life cycle social protection system that uh, reach children, older people, people with disabilities, people in uh, unemployment, and give it to everybody in those categories. And then we'll have a very, very effective system. It'll also be very good for the economy. It'll be good for social cohesion. It'll be politically popular. Um, and ultimately, it'll be much more effective in making sure that we leave nobody behind. So I'll just stop there. And apologies for going a little bit over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, thank you for a rich and quite comprehensive uh, overview of the report. Uh, I just still want to, we have already got some questions coming in and I want to remind all of the audience that you can ta um, type your questions in the chat bar to the right and we will try to cover as many as possible after um, the discussions. So I will straight away invite our first uh, discussant, who is Ms. Magdalena Sepulveda, uh, to hear about your thoughts about for the implications of these findings. So please. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that it is important to emphasize that social protection must comply with the legal framework of the country where they are uh, implemented. And this is obvious. It, it is very obvious, but unfortunately, the assessment of the design and the implementation of the program is often not done towards the comprehensive legal framework that, of course, include human rights norms. And when I refer to human rights norm, I'm referring here uh, not only to the legally binding obligations that a state voluntarily assume when they ratify the international human rights treaties, such as the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, that is binding in more than 160 countries, but it also includes domestic legal framework on human rights, such as anti-discriminatory legislation in the country, Bill of Rights and constitutional provision. A key element of this human rights obligation, which most countries around the world have assumed, is the principle of equality and the prevision of discrimination. Understanding the scope of this principle is essential to understand the great value of the evidence provided by Stephen, uh, Stephen's paper. First of all, so let me uh, just very briefly go into what is this principle of equality and non-discrimination. The principle, despite what many people think, does not entail that all persons should be treated equally and that all distinction in treatments constitute discrimination. There, there might be situation in which different treatments might, might be justified. And this is what we need to look at. What happened uh, in, if we compare those who receive the program uh, because they've been rich 
by a social protection program or those who are excluded from the program because they have not been targeted or because they have not been reached in the way in which the program has been implemented. So in order for a, a distinction, exclusion, restriction or preference be compatible with the principle of uh, equality, there's very specific criteria that need to be complied with. One is that it has to be objective and reasonable justification. There should be an objective and reasonable justification. There should be a, there should pursue a legitimate aim under human rights law. And there is a reasonable relationship of proportionality between the means employed and the aim sought to be realized. Different in treatments that do not comply with this criteria are discriminatory and infringe the principle of equality and non-discrimination. These criteria, which are applied often by the courts at the domestic level, significantly limit the discretion of the states in the design and implementation of social protection programs. Policymakers are abide by this principle. They must ensure that there is no discrimination in the process of selecting beneficiaries to social protection programs. This means that any targeting mechanism must first be justified on objective and reasonable grounds. For example, that the program is effectively reaching the poorest segments of the population. However, how the, um, if we look at the evidence provided by the paper and we see that targeting misses between 44% to 97% of those it is meant to reach, it's very clear that this is not compatible with this criteria. The second criteria is pursuing a legitimate aim. And there are many aims that one can uh, have or policymakers might have when deciding for a targeting mechanism or a poverty targeting mechanism. This might be financial reasons. This might be administrative convenience or simply trying to gain broader political support from taxpayers and median voter, in particular when the program is presented as reaching the deserving poor. Well, these are not legitimate aim from a human rights perspective, so this might be legitimate, even the economic reason might be very legitimate, but do not justify having a discriminatory treatment between those who receive the benefit and those who don't. And uh, the third element was the issue of proportionality. There is a wide range of factors that needed to be considered to, access, to assess proportionality, including the feasibility of alternative mechanism. So the question here should be, is there a more effective mechanism to minimize exclusion errors? And if there is one, then the proportionality test will not pass. And as I said before, this criteria has been increasingly used by domestic courts to decide on cases related to social protection. To the extent that targeting mechanism generates the exclusion of intended beneficiaries or is not reaching to the poorest segments of the population, there is a serious violation of the principle of equality and non-discrimination of those who are not reached. Moreover, as the paper explained and Stephen mentioned in his presentation, if poverty is a fictional construction, there are, no, there, there are not objective and reasonable criteria to differentiate among a group of impoverished people providing social protection program to some of them and excluding others. The scale of the exclusion errors with poverty targeted scheme are cer certainly not objective, reasonable, nor or proportional. It is important to take in, to take in mind that from a right perspective, inclusion errors and exclusion errors do not have the same significance. Exclusion errors are much more serious. On the one hand, exclusion errors entail a violation of the beneficiary's right to social protection. 
While the right to social protection can be implemented progressively according to the available resources of the state, it also entail, entails some immediate obligation, such as the obligation to guarantee that the right will be exercised free from discrimination of any kind. So if a, pro, if a government provides a social protection scheme, everybody who is entitled to that scheme that scheme should be rich. Otherwise, this principle will be in violation. From a rights perspective, policy choices that leads to few exclusion errors, even at the price of higher inclusion errors, are preferable to choices that lead to higher number of exclusion. While excluding those who are entitled to the benefit will violate the right to equal enjoyment of the right to social protection, giving a benefit to a person that might not be targeted by the program would hardly qualify as a human rights violation. Other human rights principles are also relevant to us to use or to assess poverty targeting mechanism. The paper did not go into, the, into them in detail, but it's implicit in some of them, and it was uh, briefly mentioned by Stephen as well. But a very another very important human rights principle is the principle of transparency. So selecting mechanisms need to be transparent, easy to grasp by the beneficiary, should not carry a st stigma, not create tensions or divisions within the community, and should be regularly reviewed to ensure progressive realizations to our universal coverage. And in many cases, proxy mean tests or other mean tests are really not fulfilling this criteria. So let me, to, let me conclude by saying that this paper shows that social protection programs must not be based on political or ideological parameters. They need to be based on evidence. And this paper provides very clear evidence about uh, the, the use of uh, some poverty targeting mechanism. But I will also add that the uh, social protection programs should also be based on national legal frameworks. Existing legal frameworks related principally to the uh, principles of equality and non-discrimination provide compulsory norms that should guide decision makers and practitioners in the design, implementation and evaluation of social protection programs. This rights-based normative approach should should always complement knowledge and evidence-based policy decision. Increasingly, when social protection practitioners ignore these legal principles, as I mentioned before, national courts, regional human rights tribunal, and human rights monitoring uh, bodies have requested the revision. So it is important to, to see that uh, if that if countries continue to use proxy mean test, for example, or any other targeted program that is not reaching to the poorest segment of society, it is possible for civil society organization, lawyers and practitioners in that country to challenge that program in the court or national human rights institution, et cetera. And we have seen that over the years that have been increased use of court decision or human rights monitoring bodies to challenge the wrong design. And this paper provides us a good evidence that can be used, and I hope it can be used in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Magdalena, and thank you for your insights and for bringing in the, the human rights-based and legal perspective on this as well. Uh, I'll go straight over to our second discussant, Andrew, and asking you the same question, what sort of implications you think that these findings will have for social protection policy? There you go. Uh, well, I think, no, I think it's wonderful, um, you know, report and evidence that uh, Stephen and this colleague have put together, um, <clears throat> and it's it's also a wonderful takedown of, of uh, sort of a lot of the 
orthodox pieces that have justified a lot of policy in the past, like as he mentions in the report, Cody Grosch and Hodenot and, and others who have been sort of justifying the accuracy of targeting mechanisms. And also this use of benefit incidence measures, which is one for Vibrate, it just always seems a bit ridiculous. It's sort of like saying, oh, this targeted program that's targeted at the bottom 20% has, uh, has uh, 40% of the program actually uh, is, 40% uh, of the people in the program are from the bottom 20%, so this is a good thing, but you actually read that and it's supposed to be 100%, so it's actually not necessarily, you know, it's 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 the, the way these statistics are used and twisted <clears throat> uh, is, is extremely problematic in these things. Um, so, uh, and I also think this is, report is a huge vindication for what through unrest, uh, particularly the, the seminal work by Tandika Makandawiri uh, in pushing for universalistic approaches, not in northern welfare states, but in uh, poor developing countries, um, as in understanding the role of universalistic uh, social policy in supporting broader development efforts, I think is so important. And I think this, this type of evidence really supports that and vindicates that type of position. And it's just it's it's important to point out. I think that in academia, it's often hard to raise attention to the problems of targeting. It's treated like a bit of an old subject that no one wants to talk about or publish anymore. If you submit an article on 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 the failures of targeting, the ed journal editors will ah, we've heard this already. It's boring stuff. Even though it's currently being practiced massively in 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 most mainstream donor promoted social protection policies and so it's really it, i think it's really crucial that this evidence is is being brought up in this way the way um uh they, they've done in this report obviously i have some questions on the methods uh, as we always do as academics we always you know uh pick through things and and, and look at the the fine details, um, but I think what's amazing is that it's the best evidence we have available, and it's produced probably on, I imagine, an extremely small budget, as opposed to the millions upon millions that finance poverty research or targeting research in the World Bank. Uh, I mean, this is the type of evidence that should be produced by the World Bank, and yet um, uh, that we don't seem to have any of this evidence available. So it's 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 just to emphasize how much of a contribution this is. Um, and I think also in terms of um, how it connects to debates around poverty, for instance, uh, there's currently ongoing, there's lots of debates, uh, Sanjay Reddy arguing with the World Bank uh, about, the, the, about the, the technicalities of the World Bank uh, purchasing power poverty uh, purchasing power parity, poverty measures, for instance, and the poverty lines. Uh, other scholars, Jason Hickel and others, coming into this debate and so on. It's a fascinating debate that's been recently uh, uh, picked up some steam and, and attention on Twitter and <laughs> and other and other platforms. Uh, but I think underlying that, I mean, underlying these questions about poverty measurement is this question of what poverty measurement is often used for in policy making. And it's this idea that if we, we can just get the poverty measurement right, uh, then we can target better, right? Um, and it's even, I think it's it's not just about income and, and expenditure, it's also uh, the multi-dimensional poverty index, which is now celebrated by many, uh, falls into the same trap. It it's, it's presents itself as a targeting indicator, it's a, as, as an improved measure for targeting. So if we can just bring this into targeting devices, uh, we can get a better uh, capture of the poor people and improve this. But I think this 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 research really shows how how badly performing targeting it is through a variety of different measures, and that just the political economy of targeting really need is 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 just really fundamentally problematic. The way targeting is practiced socially in communities or across classes where there's asymmetrical power relations and so on, it just becomes very very complica complicated. Uh, which is probably what a lot of this is is um, uh, picking up. So obviously, in the field of social protection, I mean, uh, uh, the, the you know the rise of uh, the 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 a lot of the debates around social protection and targeting and social protection are hinged on the idea that we can accurately target. Uh, so. Uh, if we, if we accept that we can accurately target, then we can move on and talk about what's then the best modality of providing social protection. As I've seen many of the questions from the, 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 the people listening have been sending in, a lot of the questions are, you know, 
what what are the best modalities that we can choose but fundamentally if 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 we start with the understanding that targeting is just simply not really working very well and quite damning evidence uh, uh, um, around that, then it forces us to reevaluate that question. Um, and it's interesting too, because in my own field research, we, you know, with my PhD students and so on, where we're looking at social protection policies now, more from the policy making angle, uh, it's 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 always interesting, uh, striking how much donors and government actors who are leading various social protection programs will insist on that their programs are being well evaluated and they'll hold up evaluations and they'll insist very strongly that you know basically they've gotten you know uh, uh, the you know a gold standard for, <laughs> through the most recent evaluation done by some consultancy firm or co you know commissioned by a donor or whatever uh, and yet the valuations are not measuring these types of things they're not measuring to what degree these programs are actually uh, uh, necessarily targeting the poor, they might be process evaluations to see if the process is actually being correctly done, uh, or they might be evaluating whether the people, once they receive the money, are actually then benefiting from the money. And you know, so, so somebody might say, well, isn't a poor person better off receiving $50 than not receiving $50? But the point is, is that if this almost random nature of targeting uh, enters into a community and this one person receives 50 but the other person who's basically in an equal situation doesn't receive 50, what does that do to social dynamics in that community? What does that do to social relations? What does that do to, to all sorts of uh, important questions uh, uh, like that? Um, so these are concerns that I know we've had very much in, in our own research. Um, and um, um, and it's also, <clears throat> I think, important to emphasize as well the different methods of how these targeting surveys are are done, and often how rarely they're done. And I think uh, Stephen's emphasis of the the volatility of poverty as well is extremely important because, you know, in several of the flagship programs that are considered to be relative success stories, for instance, the BDH, the Bono de Desarrollo Humano. In, um, in in Ecuador, at least up until 2012, or the Pantaweed in Philippines, for instance, um, these are based on surveys that will be taken in one year, and then the survey, then the, all of the targeting will be on the basis of that one survey, and then they won't rerun the survey for five or more years, uh, and then the targeting will continue to be based on that survey that's increasingly out of date. Uh, that and and uh, which becomes incredibly problematic and even the targeting on the basis of that survey at the moment it's done is problematic but when that the time elapses and then you're five or six or seven years later and there hasn't been a resurvey and they're still relying on the initial survey to evaluate who's the poorest it becomes it, it just becomes um, extremely problematic um, uh, and of course I think there's also putting this evidence, how am I doing for time? I probably, I'll wrap up quickly, but it's just putting this evidence into the bigger picture, which I, I know uh, Stephen and colleagues at Development Pathways have been looking at these bigger issues as well, because this support report is only really looking at the inclusion and exclusion errors. It's not looking at uh, the actual, the, um, uh, the depth, for instance, of the programs, how much uh, the transfer uh, amounts to in, in the various programs, how much it's actually addressing need in these programs, uh, to, uh, and um, the amount of resources that are being transferred and so on. I, I know Stephen's done work on this, and I look forward to further reports uh, from him and his colleagues on this. Uh, but it is also interesting, I find, because one of the questions that this raises is, and I think many of the participants are, are questioning perhaps, is, uh, okay, fine, so universalism is better, but how do we afford it, right? So, you know, I've had this discussion in Zambia, for instance, where the government's entire revenue was, say, 18% of GDP, but 80% of that is salaries. So that leaves you with well, 20% of 18% of GDP, it doesn't leave you with that much. So if somebody comes along and says, well, it's only going to cost you 2% uh, of GDP to do a universal pension scheme, that's not much. But then for the finance ministry, that's huge because it basically amounts to most of their non-salary budget, which is then needed for infrastructure. It's then needed for financing a variety of capital expenditures in education and health and so on. So, so the question obviously is, 
okay, fine. So, you know, the big justification for targeting is that resources are limited. So we need to target. So that's always been the justification, the sort of political economy justification for targeting. This report really shows that, obviously, even if we accept that justification, uh, it's not a solution to the problem. Uh, but I think also what's inter interesting is that uh, what we've seen in our work is that um, uh, is that whereas the international community or a lot of international donors have been pushing times up, yeah, have been pushing uh, 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 targeting to 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 a large extent as the model to follow for various reasons. In many cases, we look at governments, even in quite poor countries, who uh, using their own resources without requiring foreign, you know, foreign aid and, and, and so on, actually adopt other types of programs, which much larger expenditures than these targeted social protection programs, which aren't necessarily universalistic, but have are moving more towards that uh, direction in terms of being having a more comprehensive cross-class coverage of the population. And I think that's really one of the key concerns that I have, we have in our research project is, is the degree to which a lot of these targeting programs, even if you perfect the targeting and you do target poor people much better than what this evidence is showing, there's still the underlying problem that targeting systems tend to create segregations in populations, in the provisioning systems, uh, which has huge issues for social inequality and justice and I would argue human rights. And my big question to the human rights community on this is to what degree they address these broader political economy issues in terms of how targeting affects processes of social ordering and so on. So I'll stop there. Happy to answer any questions in relationship to that. Thank you, Andrew, and sorry for stressing you with my webcam. Uh, thank you for bringing in a, a policy angle and an academic perspective to it. Uh, I'd invite all the speakers to put your webcams on, so Andrew, you can remain there, uh, but maybe keep your mics muted until you are addressed. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to dive in straight to the questions. We've gotten a lot of them, so we won't, unfortunately, have time to cover all. Uh, so I will take the liberty of choosing for you. Um, there's uh, quite a bit of technical questions, which I may not go too much into because I think a lot of them are actually answered in the report in a bit more detail. And then there are a bit more of policy questions that we will try to cover. Uh, but the first one is a little bit of both. It's the second question. Uh, it's about uh, the reasons for uh, the exclusion errors. So I'll read it. Uh, is the exclusion of intended recipients only related to the type of targeting mechanism, or is it also does it also reflect the inability of governance uh, to finance a program that embraces tries to embrace all the needy ones due to but yeah due to lack of resources? Perhaps Stephen, you want to start, and then uh, Andrew and Magdalena can fill in. Okay, thanks very much for the for for the question. I mean, I think um, you know the, the the way in which we did the 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 research and looking at the intended recipients, we 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 took away the the capacity of governments to be able to fund programs because we looked say if a government is is funding a program for the poorest seven percent or the poorest eight percent, we just looked at how effective they are in reaching the poorest seven percent or the poorest eight percent of the category intended category within which that, that that is so we're actually then looking just at the effectiveness of the targeting mechanism itself i think of course when we're looking at the the, the effectiveness against the poorest 20 percent then i think in part that is that is also incorporating the 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 fact of whether governments have funded sufficiently the program to be large enough to even reach the 20 percent of course many of the programs we looked at we're not reaching the poorest 20 percent and as i mentioned that's often because these poverty targeted programs are so unpopular they're very popular with donors and but they're not very popular with governments because governments uh you know you're you're not going to win an election by targeting a program at the very very poorest you're going to win an election with an inclusive universal program everybody benefits and therefore they'll put you into power and you'll be able to have a much more effective program. That's what governments want. Many de in democratic contexts, that's what they, they they want to do. There's political rewards, but they're also much more effective um, programs. Um, so I think in terms of when you look at the the two types of errors, it kind of takes in, into account both things that you 
you, you're talking about. But for the first 20 percent, you need to um, bear in mind the fact that, you know, some programs are just very, very small because governments really aren't that interested in in supporting them. And some of the programs I looked at were tiny. Um, you know, and really, you couldn't say there's any political support for them at all. Such so a leap program down and two percent of households, tiny. Thank you. Can I? Okay. Go? Yeah. Uh, yes. Go ahead. Mark. I think that it's important also to stress that, and and it was clear in the graphic, especially for those excluded in universal programs, that there are other obstacles that people living in poverty face to enjoy or to be able to benefit from a program. You can have, and these are also programs uh, problems that can come in the design of the program. So if you have administrative measures that require to have certain identification, uh, national identification, well, the poorest or more excluded might not have that or certain minorities might not have that national identity document. It might also be that in order to register into the in, into the program, you need to, uh, you, you have a, a, to walk a lot of a, a, a very long distance and you cannot do that and, or it might not be affordable. If you have to pay for transportation to go to receive the benefit or to register into the program, it might not be beneficial for you. I mean, it will not be cost effective. Or if you have to, or sometimes problems that we have found is that uh, the program is not gender sensitive. So you have long queues of documents and it, it doesn't consider, for example, people with limited mobility, like uh, pregnant women, older women, et cetera, et cetera. So there are many other problems that also impact but when the when the problems come from the targeting it's just you're leaving from from the very beginning you're just leaving a huge amount of people out so this other uh, aspect of these other obstacles that people face should also be uh, taken into account uh, but uh, with with a universal program or with a targeted program but with a universal programs we are already talking about the inclusion by design of many more people. And, and very briefly, I want to add on what uh, an example of what Andrew um, mentioned in, in regard to the retargeting. Um, in the case, for example, of Argentina, with, uh, with the old programs, uh, Programas Jefas y Jefes de Hogar Desocupado, this was a conditional cash transfer that came uh, when uh, when it was the Argentine crisis, uh, the program was closed actually for you needed to register into the program at a specific time. And this was take, was took to the court by uh, several uh, people that actually fell into poverty after the date in which you was the deadline for registering into the program or simply they did not have the time to go during the date. And, and, the, and in several uh, judges, because it was several cases that came to the courts in Argentina, consider that putting a, tar uh, putting a deadline and that, or not doing a retargeting of the program imply a violation of the rights of those beneficiary. And the judges were very explicit and say, there is no justification, the economic factor that, the, that if we open the program will be more expensive is not a legitimate justification to leave outside all these people. So, and, and this, I just wanted to stress there are cases around the world that challenge social protection programs for this precise uh, element. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Magdalena. Andrew, do you have anything to add in terms of the reasons for exclusion errors? No, I, I, I actually just want to say, I mean, I think a lot of the, the question that you read was I think an excellent question and a lot of these questions are really excellent. And unfortunately, I'm, the limited time can't discuss them all. But actually, the, the essence of that question was something that Stephen and I were going back and forth for over the past couple of weeks, to, uh, myself trying to figure out in the data, for instance, you could hypothetically say, I mean, there could be several reasons for extremely high exclusion areas that I could think of uh, coming up in these studies, one being that as you say, a limit of government resources where the government says, OK, we're going to target the you know, the poor is 10%, but we have a limited budget and we're going to cap the number that we actually put into the program at this number. So then once it's capped, it's capped and then you don't capture the rest. And then if you do a study that then measures 
you know, the, the number of people who are actually under that 10% not being covered by the program, then you got a very high exclusion error. Or another problem might be, as I think Stephen was also saying, some of these programs are very small and might be piloted in various parts of uh, places, and it's very hard to then get survey data that can be disaggregated down to a very local area that's accurate, right? Um, so I could see issues there with the data measurement. But that being said, I have not seen this type of data being produced anywhere by any organization with much greater resources and funding than, than what they've been able to produce. So uh, I think this is a starting point for further discussions and further research. And I think the contribution is huge in that sense because, because you simply cannot find this data elsewhere. Right? And it raises the very important question of, of you know, of can we even target in the first place, right? So, basically. Okay, thank you. Um, we will move on to a policy questions that I like a lot. It's uh, number 11 from Kashif. He asks essentially about, is there such a thing as the perfect mix of universal and targeted programs? Um, it's specifically related to persons with disabilities, but I think you can answer it generally. Is there, can there be a good mix of targeted and universal, or should we go for only universal? I'll leave anyone who wants to start. Um, I, I can start. I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's um, the problem we have in many programs is, you know, many programs in low middle income countries, particularly those promoted by uh, international donors are actually following a model that we used in Europe in the 19th century and it's been imposed now across low and middle income countries where we're just tar trying to target the very poorest it's what we call poor relief and uh, it wasn't very successful it wasn't very popular and we kind of eliminated it in the 19th century it's now happening yet again but in low and middle income countries basically promoted by by donors what actually happened in, in high income countries across Europe is that we then developed a whole set of programs for citizens, all citizens, to address uh, risks across the life cycle for children, people with disabilities, older people. And most of those programs became effectively universal programs. So we have the basic solid foundations of a system and that which include most people at the key risks at the face of the life cycle, having these programs which are universal so we can guarantee access for these main risks but then they're complemented always by a small uh, number of very small residual programs it may be much more targeted and probably targeted and european countries perhaps can do it better and where we have this kind of mix of programs but we're at a stage in many countries where we really need to get back to the building the foundations so we need to build an inclusive life cycle social protection system starting with inclusive coverage or, you know, or high coverage of the key risks particularly children older people, people with disabilities. And it can be done. I see a lot of the questions are, are, are about, well, governments can't afford it. Actually, we've done a lot of work around the world that looking at the cost. Actually, governments can afford it, particularly if you plan to bring these programs in over a period of 10 years. And we've got a lot of techniques to show that this is possible in this fiscal space. So there is a good mix, but it's about building the kind of life cycle system that we find in high income countries and we find increasingly in low and middle income countries that they're trying, progressive countries are trying to put similar kind of systems in place. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Does anyone, Magdalena, Andrew, to comment on that? Your mic, Andrew. Yeah, do you want to say something, Magdalena, or should I go ahead? Maybe you want to respond to what I say. Uh, but no, I think, I, I, I mean, a key reading in social policy, I believe, is say the scope poll targeting within universalism, right? So you go back targeting universalism, targeting universal. Well, her point was like, if you want to target special needs, exactly the points that Mike Delano was referring to, uh, the best ways to target special needs is through universalistic systems, right? And I, I actually, in social protection, I have a more difficulty conceptualizing this in social protection, but if you think uh, in health and education, for instance, uh, if you have special needs in the ed in education system, it's much easier to target those special needs when you have a comprehensive edu you know, education system that's where quality standards are managed across the whole population uh, when the, the, the most of children besides the wealthy elites 
are integrated within that system and then an uh, education ministry can evaluate needs within that system and then target them specifically right so i mean that was the the, the feminist critique to universalism there was you know part of that the response to that was then well it's within you you know to address the various particular needs uh <clears throat> that uh you know that you can't address by having sort of equal treatment for all are nonetheless best treated within these types of universalistic systems and i think in then in the, that that's in contrast to an idea of targeting as a, as an entire modality of, of social provisioning where you just segregate services or benefits off to poor people right so i think that's really the key distinguishing uh feature when we're talking about these types of issues right um you know so yeah i'll, I'll leave it there because maybe michael and Elsa wants to say something Oh, I'll turn off my mic. Uh, Magdalena, your mic, I think. N no, I, I fully agree with Stephen and Andrew, or, so nothing to add. Okay, uh, we also had a question, Stephen, you alluded to it in the end of your presentation, uh, but why does the rich prefer poverty targeting? You said that the elites uh, win on poverty targeting. Would you care to elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, um, I mean, I think the, the, I saw the question was, like, um, was about that, but also, you know, I've said that, you know, programs are, are popular, therefore taxpayers will put more money in. So it seems to be a contradiction, I think, and, and, and other things that I've said before. And I think there is actually no, no contradiction. Left to themselves, the rich, obviously we can see around the world now increasingly, you know, are trying to avoid tax and pay less tax. Therefore, they're going to get behind programs that are targeted more at the poor. We see that, you know, I live in the United Kingdom, where we've had austerity, where we've had cuts and cuts on the social protection system. And at the same time, taxes have gone down and the rich have become richer as a result of that because they're paying less taxes. And this is what you find, this is the reason why the rich, you know, they know they have to have some social protection system, but generally they don't, the very rich, they don't want to um, um, pay a high tax to be able to cover it. Now, the reason why programs, though, universal programs do get political support is because they build alliances across the majority of the population. So while the very rich may lose out because of the, the high taxes, probably 67 to 80% in many countries might be net winners out of the redistribution that comes from, from taxes. So you're going to get 70 80% or more are going to, be, to get behind more universal programs because they're going to be the winners out of those programs. These programs tend to be have higher levels of funding are much higher quality and therefore get much more um, support and that's how you can generate more resources within within countries because over time by putting in place high quality programs for that, that all citizens can reach you'll build the social contract and people be over time more willing to pay tax they you generate more tax and therefore you can turn that into redistribution and put in place better social protection education health services and other and other kinds of services. So I hope that explains the, um, the, the apparent contradiction. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Magdalene and Andrew, do you want to comment on this one? No? Uh, yes. Oh yeah, I, I could say something quickly. I mean, I think, the, I think we have to be careful. The argument that universalism is seen as pro, that the elite would like it or pro elite, or pro-rich is is a uh, comes from a well, what we might say a neoliberal or conservative critique of universal uh, systems. Uh, I mean, you would read that, for instance, in the Economist magazine, saying you know, uh, are arguing that government social programs are actually benefiting rich people more than poor people. So how unjust is that? It's a it's an implicit critique of universal types of systems. So. Uh, uh, I would just be careful with that that argument because slipping into that assumption could be just adopting that type of logic. Um, whereas generally, what we see is that universalistic systems emerge from much more cross cross class basis of solidarity and targeting systems. Yeah, I mean uh, exactly as Stephen says. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, this webinar is running to an end, and we have had so many more questions. Um, 
all the questions will actually be compiled to the speakers, so there is a chance that they might still be able to reach out to you. Uh, we'll see about that. Also, for um, quite a few questions, as I said, about methodology, I, I do recommend you to read the full report because they might be answered there. Uh, I just want to round up by asking all of you speakers um, like a 30 second answer. Based on these findings, if you had a chance to talk to a high policy maker when it comes to social protection, what would you tell them? 30 seconds. And I think I'll start with Stephen again, since you wrote it. Okay, I'll, I'll say something. I think there was a Universal Child Benefit Conference I, I attended, you know, run by UNICEF. And I'll just repeat something I said there. Um, you know, a definition of madness, people would say, is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And I think what we show in our research is that actually, and a lot of the questions are here, you can keep on doing poverty targeting and try and keep on doing poverty, you'll end up with the same result. It will fail, right? And that's the definition of madness. So we need to do something different. We need to actually reach out and build more inclusive, effective programs that actually really do not leave any, anybody behind. And that's what I would say. Thank you. Magdalena, do you want to give us? Increasingly, there's been uh, a, a, an increased rhetoric by uh, international organizations and by governments about the rights-based approach to social protection. Uh, and also, uh, there's been um, a lot of work done uh, in theory by the ILO and the World Bank on universal social protection. Well, these terms have a meaning. When we talk about a rights-based approach, when we talk about universal social protection, they do have a meaning and imply that we need to comply with several principles that are enshrined in laws at the domestic level and the international level. And if we do not pay attention to those uh, legal frameworks, we are really just paying lip service to the rights-based approach. That's all. And Andrew. Yeah, I well, I would say read the report. <laughs> Basically, I think uh, the I think there's a lot of very uh, intelligent and well-meaning people in the social protection field as practitioners, so to speak, uh, and who, who who when presented with the evidence would give a very serious rethink to maybe the models that have been pushed over the last 10 or 20 years. Um, and, uh, and, and so I would just say, read the report, you know, even though it's long for the average policymaker to read, but read it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you to all of you speakers. Um, and thank you to socialprotection.org for um, allowing us to have this platform uh, to present the report. And just as Andrew said, I would also say, um, please read the report, share it, use it, and uh, keep on question, <laughs> question it as well. Um, yeah, and with those words, thank you very much for the webinar. Thank you for joining us and have a good day or good night, depending on where you are. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.